Hi, everybody. My name is Paula Price. I'm with the People's Law School, and I'm delighted to be welcoming you to today's webinar. It is all about defamation in British Columbia. We've got an amazing speaker, Dan Coles from Owen Bird Law Corporation. We'll be introducing Dan in just a couple of minutes, but before that, wanted to get settled in. Today's session is 60 minutes long. We will be answering questions. We'll be answering questions that we've prepared ahead of time that come in frequently to um, Dan's practice and questions that people often have about defamation. We will also be answering your questions at the end of the webinar live. Uh, today's session is to provide you with legal information, not legal advice, that is current as of today. So if what you're seeking is legal advice, which is really the law as it, re as it relates and applies to your particular set of circumstances, we would encourage you to seek legal counsel and um, you're welcome to contact our speaker, Dan Coles. His contact information is here on the slide. With that, we would like to make some acknowledgements. The, law, the People's Law School team is grateful to work on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And we would invite everyone joining us here today to reflect on the lands from which they're joining us. We would also like to thank our funders, uh, the Department of Justice Canada, the Law Foundation of British Columbia, and the Notary Foundation of British Columbia, whose financial support make production of today's webinar possible. And finally, last but not least, we would like to thank our speaker and welcome him, Dan Coles. He is a lawyer at Owen Bird Law Corporation. He has a varied litigation practice. Uh, one of the areas that he practices in is in media and defamation law. We are delighted to have him here. Dan has been a big supporter of the work here at People's Law School. He reviewed a number of pages on defamation that show up on the People's Law School website and the Dialogue website. So very happy to have him here today to engage with us live to talk about these issues. And if you go onto Dan's uh, law firm website, you'll also be able to see that he has been involved in a number of high profile cases that deal with media and defamation law. Um, and his practice has a very interesting twist because he's looking at, and we'll talk about this more in today's session, but that um, that the, the, the tension between defamation and freedom of expression, that's one of the areas. And another area where he seems to be doing quite a bit of work we talked about yesterday is in terms of um, access to information. So helping media outlets get access to information that they can then share with the public. So welcome, Dan. I hope I got that all right. Um, welcome. It's so great to have you here. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, thanks, Paula. You can hear me okay? We can hear you great. That's a, uh, that's a photo of me from 2016. And uh, I look a little bit, uh, I think, more bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I didn't have kids back then. Uh, because the kids, the kids will do it. The kids yeah. and the pandemic will do it. But I think you still look great. So uh. you can see the start of my facial hair there. I think it was on a couple of days of no shaving. And uh, anyway, here's the end result six years here's later. Here's the end result. So, Dan, our first question is, um, what is defamation? The so defamation is a tort. And that is, a, that is a civil wrong. That is something that you can sue another person for, uh, for some sort of remedy. The remedy we often think about is damages, so it'd be money, but it could be other remedies. Injunction, in, injunctive relief is another common remedy to defamation, which is where the court order will, a court will order an individual to stop doing something or to take something off the internet or take something down at their workplace. So the elements of the tort, there's only three, and it's relatively straightforward. It's a very old tort. And the first one is that, is that the words at issue must um, lower the reputation of the defendant or the victim or the person being talked about in the eyes of a reasonable person. So that, that's, that's almost the thrust of the tort there. That's the first thing. We need words, although in some cases it could be an image we typically think about defamation, um, a Facebook post or a news article or a letter or a note circulated in a school or workplace, but it could be an image. You, you can imagine how someone's face um, superimposed over someone else's body could cause them reputational harm. There could be imputations to that image. 
The second element of the tort is that the defamation must uh, refer to the, the defendant or the person who's going to start a claim. And while that sounds obvious, and sometimes it is, you can imagine a front page news headline that says, Dan Cole's thief, and there's a picture of my face, and there's no question that I've been defamed. Um, but it may just say, um, you know, 30 something lawyer at Owen Bird, you know, caught stealing, who practices in the law of defamation. I might be pretty upset because I think all of my friends and family know that's talking about me, but I'm not the only lawyer at Owen Bird who practices defamation. So it could be an open question proving that second element of the tort, which is that the defamatory conduct refers to me if I'm the complainant. And then the third element is publication to an audience. So it's not, def it's not defamatory, a one-on-one -on -one communication. It, it, has to, it has to be published to a third party. So if those three elements have been um, proven and proven on a balance of probabilities, which in the civil standard means 51%, more likely than not, all three of those elements occurred, then falsity is presumed at law. You said something bad about me. Uh, the law presumes it's, it's false. My good reputation is assumed. And damages are assumed. Those damages, we still need to quantify them. Damages meaning money. But it's assumed I'm going to get something. And then we move on to the defenses. But generally speaking, those three elements, something that would lower my reputation in the eyes of reasonable people. And we can talk about what a reasonable person is, uh, that it's been communicated to third, to third persons, and that it refers to me. You prove all those things, you've got the tort of defamation. Super. Thanks so much, Dan. And, and sort of um, additional question. Uh, I understand there is also a criminal defamation as well. And what we're talking about today is the civil tort of defamation. Is that right? Absolutely. There is, I think, a, a pretty rarely used section of the criminal code for criminal defamation. I think it may be worded something slightly different. But yes, we're strictly talking about the tort of civil defamation which in British Columbia, you would commence in the Supreme Court. The small claims court does not have jurisdiction in defamation and neither does the civil resolution tribunal. So if you're going to sue someone in British Columbia for the tort of defamation, that's to be done in, in the Superior Court. Well, that's excellent information. Um, thank you for that. Um, the second question that we have for you today is, what is the difference between libel and slander? So defamation is the um, umbrella term for what we've just described. False statements published, meaning circulated to others. <clears throat> Excuse me. Libel is the technical term for defamation in a permanent form. So you've been libeled or something is libelous if it's reduced to writing. So that would capture newspaper publications, that would capture uh, anything written in letters, notes, most social media. Uh, slander is oral. So slander lawsuits are, are increasingly rare. Um, as Unless you're going to sue someone over something they said at a cocktail party. Most people who have been seriously defamed have been defamed in writing. So that's the primary difference between the two. Slander lawsuits are harder to prove, much harder to get the evidence. You have to prosecute those claims much more quickly for that reason. Um, <clears throat> Also, there's one sort of wrinkle in the law, which is that damages and slander are not presumed. The idea being what someone says out of their mouth that's not captured permanently is less likely to have a permanent stain on your reputation. So you have to prove you've suffered damages, which would typically be lost an employment opportunity. You've lost some sort of um, business or schooling type um, engagement, whereas in libel, it's presumed you've been harmed because there's a permanent record of the of the defamatory statement, and the issue is just quantifying how much your damages have been or what the other remedies are. Excellent, thank you for that. And Dan, you mentioned earlier with the written um, <laughs> forms that the I gather that would have been the, the libel that yes. it could be an image. It doesn't necessarily have to be words in itself. And so, okay. if you're looking at libel and you're looking at slander, for example, yes. could that be like some thing you do with your hands or it could be body language or it could be something other than actual words or how does that work? That's, that's right. Anything that is 
that is a communication that's going to lower your reputation that's not permanently captured would be slander. So again, you're probably looking at case law from a couple hundred years ago in England where there's been a reported decision about a, a hand signal that was defamatory. Uh, but you can imagine how, how pointing to someone or something in the right context could indicate an affiliation or in some way uh, lowering of someone's reputation. But, but as I said, you see, you don't see very much of that anymore. Most claims are libel. My, my recollection is the Libel and Slander Act in BC by statute mandates that uh, radio broadcasts count as libel. And anything permanent like in a video would be liable too. So a, a TikTok video or Facebook or something like that. Again, where we have a permanent record, and as I'm sure we'll talk about with the internet, anything that's permanent put on the internet is going to stay up there for a very long time and is probably going to circulate very quickly. Um, in some cases, it, it's much more damaging to a person who's been wronged um, than maybe a newspaper 20 years ago, where there's the old adage that today's newspapers, you know, line tomorrow's waste paper baskets. It, it's, it's less permanent in that sense. Okay, super. Thank you so much, Dan. And um, the next question that we have is, let's say that you have um, been accused of defamation or if there's um, something that has happened, you've met these three criteria. What are the possible defenses that are available? I should, I should say before answering that question, just to highlight that uh, someone who, who, who feels like they maybe have been defamed or want to start an action should also consider other remedies, such as um, BC Human Rights Tribunal type proceedings, um, maybe workplace legislation or type complaints. Um, Oftentimes people are, are, I think, in my experience anyway, are quick to say, you know, I've been defamed and the remedies that we're going to pursue are through the tort of defamation, when oftentimes what people are really upset about is someone has said something that hurts them, someone has said something offensive, they've been denied a, a benefit or a privilege or an, or an opportunity with a landlord or with an employer, and there's, there's other statutory remedies or other procedural remedies that, aren't, that, that can address the harm of something that someone did, you know, through through words, but is not quite square with communications that harm reputation. So, so I think that and it's almost like a procedural defense. If someone's being accused of defamation, take a step back and say, actually, what you're what you're complaining about is maybe a workplace issue, and we should deal with that differently. Or I'll talk to my lawyer about that. Or that's a BC Human Rights type complaint. That's a sidebar. I'm happy to explore that for questions. Yeah, and, and I might actually just interrupt you right there and, and pause on that for a second, because I think what you said earlier was, was quite interesting too, right? That the forum for this, for a defamation suit is the Supreme Court. So if you yeah. have a lower value claim, those yes. typical options like the CRT or the provincial court isn't available to you. So if you're in this situation where maybe it's defamation or maybe it's something that there's a recourse through the Human Rights Tribunal or through um, workplace uh, okay. procedures, that's that that may be a better option for you. Do you have any um, examples that come to mind where you would be looking at, okay, this could be one or the other? I don't have a concrete example other than to reiterate that defamation is about damage to reputation and your 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 reputation being damaged may cause you hurt, hurt feelings, frustration, but, but the threshold is your, your reputation has been damaged. So you may have an experience dealing with your a landlord who makes a disparaging remark about who you are or your family status or your age that is deeply hurtful to you, but it's not, it's not lowering your, your reputation. Maybe sufficient people haven't heard it, um, so it, it, it's not that third person publication, but also a derogatory comment about your age isn't lowering your, rep, your reputation, your age is your age. But if your landlord is mistreating you and is maybe denying you that lease renewal that you're entitled to, your remedy would be with the residential tenancy board. Similarly, there's going to be workplace tribunals, or it could be BC Human Rights Tribunal. So things even outside of the small claims court, or, or if you've been fired from your workplace, and you want to commence an action in uh, provincial small claims court to recover commissions you were entitled to, for example, under contract, and you say, well, you know, the reason I didn't get these commissions is, is my boss said this about me, and it was 
terribly hurtful and it was incorrect, um, but it may not rise to the level of defamation. We have to think about those, those three elements I talked about earlier. And to get through the gate to make a defamation claim, we have to have a statement made by someone, or as we said, potentially an image or, or something else that lowers your reputation in the eyes of reasonable people. And, and that, is, that is conceptually different than someone saying something that's offensive or that hurts your feelings. So I, I would say to anyone listening, if you've got um, claims that may, that may be um, very important to you and very really impact your ability to live and your ability to work and to access government services or the public services, and, and you feel like you've been the victim of, of abuse from someone, you, these other tribunals we've just talked about, and, and you guys can probably put some hyperlinks up to them, may be a more appropriate and certainly quicker and cheaper avenue to get some recourse than commencing a lawsuit in the Supreme Court. Yeah, thank you so much, Dan. That's really helpful. Really puts it, in, it really puts into context. So now we'll, now we'll get to the defenses. <laughs> if what we're dealing with is defamation. Um, making what a claim for defamation is relatively easy. Someone sends around an email that says Dan Coles is a crook. And that email has been read by other people. That's, that's the tort. That's easy. I've, I've proven the claim. So I've been defamed. Where the rubber really hits the road is in all the different defenses. So the most obvious defense is truth. And, and this sort of, we're gonna talk about freedom of speech later, I think, but um, it's a complete defense to a defamation claim if you're merely repeating the truth. And the truth can be hard to prove in court, unfortunately. And it's not the truth just because you believe it's the truth. I think in Seinfeld, George Costanza makes some comment about that on a, a lie detector test. Uh, episode. In any event, you, you have to prove substantially that what you said is true if you're going to rely on the truth of de uh, the defense of truth, also called justification in the case law. So that's the most obvious defense, but sometimes it's not available because you, you, you said something or published something that 12 months, 18 months later in a courtroom, you just can't, you can't prove it. You have a strong suspicion, but, but you can't prove it. Probably the next most common defense is, is called uh, fair comment or opinion. And this applies to statements that really can't be proven true or false because they're, they're an opinion. They're incapable of proof. So <clears throat> how that works is you can say, in my view, in my opinion, I believe something to that effect that you know Dan Coles is a bad lawyer. But you have to say, here's why. That's what's important with the defense, is you have to have an opinion that is based on provable facts. So <clears throat> you want to write an expose about me, for example, and you want to be critical of me, critical in a way that's going to lower my reputation in the eyes of readers, and you want to call me bad names in your opinion, that, that has to be based on fact. And those facts have to be provable by you at trial, or are otherwise so known and, and obvious um, that they don't have to be set out in detail in the article. But if you don't have that factual basis, and we go back to just an email calling me a crook or a bad lawyer, um, that defense is not going to be applicable. Fair comment also only applies to matters of public interest. And that's a difficult concept to apply. But the defense is probably not going to be available if you just say really cruel things about your niece on Instagram. Because whether your niece is a good person or a bad person is probably not a matter of public interest. Public interest doesn't mean it has to be, you know, celebrities and government figures and matters of, of provincial or national importance, but it does mean um, something that citizens generally have an interest in the subject matter. So um, careful when, when thinking about the defense of, of opinion or fair comment, because it's only available to matters on public interest. And the last thing I should say about uh, most of these defenses is malice will make the defenses unavailable. So going back to the opinion example, you can, you can write an opinion piece, an op-ed, being critical of, of someone who's on a topic of public interest, 
But if someone complains about that and sues the author or publisher in defamation, and the evidence comes out at trial that those people really didn't like the subject of the article and the predominant purpose of writing it was malice was to take the person down, then no amount of weasel words about I believe or I think will save you because, because malice is what, um, what actuated the writing. A couple other defenses I want, I want to just touch on briefly. A relatively new defense in the last, say, 20 years, 15 years, is called responsible communication or responsible journalism. We get that defense out of England. Um, it's not available only to journalists, although the shorthand responsible journalism sort of suggests it is. The idea is, again, if you're writing about something that's a matter of public interest and you do a diligent job researching the issue, and one of the factors there will be the significance of the matter, how urgent it is to, to publish or write about this issue, and perhaps most importantly, getting comment from the target of the piece, you can defend errors in that comment or in that article under the defense of responsible communication. That's why uh, listeners or viewers today will often see or hear about in news reporting, so-and-so wasn't available for comment. Uh, journalists will put that in to, to indicate to everyone that they tried to contact the, the subject of the story to get their view, to get their side of it, right? That's evidencing responsibility. So again, if you're going to go on Facebook and write something really critical about someone, leaving aside whether it's a matter of public interest and of significant importance, if you didn't get the target of the story's side of things, that defense is not going to be available to you. And lastly, I'll, I'll touch just briefly on privileges. There's absolute privilege. Um, individuals can say things in court, in legislatures that are entitled to be um, wrong. They're protected by absolute privilege. And then there's qualified privilege. Qualified privilege, typical scenario might be making a complaint to a um, police officer, a complaint to a disciplinary panel, might be a complaint to a strata board. The idea is there's a reciprocity of you, the complainant, believe the person you're speaking to has a duty to receive the information, a position in society, a training a station life for employment where they're the person to take that information and the person receiving that that information also understands that they're in that role um, uh, if someone gives your name as a job as a job reference and the new employer for that person calls you up and says hey dan well, you know what do you think about so and so you can speak frankly if 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 the, if the person applying for a job has given your name as a reference society expects that you can do that you that you speak candidly about that um, again if you're being malicious these defenses don't apply but otherwise all of these defenses operate to further freedom of speech and to further the public interest which is in some instances you're entitled to be wrong that's what qualified privilege means you were wrong in saying that you made a mistake but it was an occasion of qualified privilege so it's okay your news article about this politician had errors in it. That politician didn't do what you said they did, but, it, but you're defended because it was responsibly researched. And there's a couple other defenses that, that are a little bit more technical, but those are the main thrusts of them, Paul. I'm conscious about time. That's super. Thank you so much, Dan. And I'll just uh, make a note for anybody who is interested. These uh, defenses are all listed out on the People's Law School website and on the pages that Dan has reviewed. So um, you're welcome to go there and, and have a look at those. Um, and I'm also mindful of the time as well, but there was a question that came in from somebody who's attending and they were asking about what happens when you knowingly file a false police report. And so in this case, you talked about the qualified privilege that I assume would apply if you're speaking with a police officer about something that happened, but then you also spoke about malice, that if what you're doing was intentionally false, that you wouldn't be protected. So how would that play out? Well, uh, that's the difference between an absolute privilege and a qualified privilege. An absolute privilege would protect false reports and Absolute privilege may apply to police reporting in the UK. A, 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 a BC Court of Appeal decision comes to mind where our Court of Appeal recently revisited the issue of what privilege applies to police reports. 
and they they did not follow it. And I think the jurisdictions, the UK, but but please, no one say Dan Coles told you that's the case. Um, so absolute privilege is important if you think about it. Um, for a barrister like me doing my job in court, I'm a mouthpiece for my client. I'm a champion for their cause. No one should be able to sue me because I say wrong things for the wrong reasons through a course of advocacy, similar with politicians speaking in parliament. They advocate for what they want, why they want, and, and you're not permitted to peel behind the layers. Police reports are different. That's a qualified privilege. So if someone knowingly files a false report, that would probably count as malice, which would make um, the defense of qualified privilege no longer available to them. So again, depending on how that report, again, is published, is it repeated to third parties? What, what, what actions, if any, do the police do with that report? It could very much be actionable. But I should caution anyone, because in my practice, I hear this, that feuding spouses or feuding neighbors often allege the opposite party is filing false police reports. Again, that's hard, it's very hard to prove. It's notoriously difficult to prove malice because conversely, it's very easy for someone to say, look, I was mistaken. I'm sorry. The party was at two houses over. I called the police on one house over or oops, I, saw, I thought that red car in the driveway was my ex-wife's. I guess it wasn't. And someone may know in the heart of hearts that so-and-so is lying about it. But again, you have to you, the plaintiff, has to prove that the defendant relying on qualified privilege, their predominant purpose was malice. And short of getting the proverbial smoking gun, seeing a text message where somebody admits it, it's very hard to do. So I hope, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's really great. Thanks so much, Dan. I appreciate you uh, explaining some of the nuances here because it's uh, such an interesting area. Um, next question, which is, um, what about rights to freedom of speech? This is, a, this is a fun one, and, and this, is, this is something that um, Western democracies, Canada in particular, have been, have been grappling with for, for you know, more recently decades, but centuries. I would say the short answer is this. Um, all freedoms in Canada are subject to the rule of law. And you know, w w without going into a sidebar on, on recent events in Canada, we're not an absolutely free country everything is freedom within a rule of law. And that's how our system works. So the, the charter section 2B, which some viewers are probably familiar with, protects our right to um, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, freedom um, of assembly, um, but subject to limits also prescribed by law. So I, I like to think of a, a classic example is no one has ever been free to scream fire in a crowded movie theater when there is no fire. That, that's, ju that's just mischief, and that's likely to get people hurt and cause a whole bunch of damage. Similarly, we have well-established laws in this country about fraud, sedition, you know, attempts to overthrow the government, uh, treason, most often in, in sort of national security, military contexts, hate speech uh, against uh, minority groups, advocating violence, uttering threats. I mean, the list goes on where you can think of examples where the concept of freedom of speech just doesn't apply because as society and often as reduced in the criminal code have said, well, that's just, it's unacceptable. You can't threaten to harm someone. And when the police knock on your door say, well, I was just expressing myself. And, and often we say that because um, politicians and judges have, have analyzed the value of speech and some speech, some speech rather has a lot of value, political speech, speech where um, uh, citizens um, express self-identity, self-actualization, share of information, whereas false speech, speech that isn't true, in some contexts, commercial speech, um, have less value. And oftentimes it's very case by case specific, but I suppose what I'm trying to outline is um, the law of defamation tries to create a balance between an individual's right of expression with an individual's right of reputation which our courts have acknowledged that reputation uh, is key to self-identity, self-worth, a sense of dignity. So in defamation lawsuits, the courts are called upon to balance those often two competing interests. 
and always is the case, depending on the facts, someone's, you know, op-ed piece about who's a good guy, who's a bad guy, what should have been done or shouldn't have been done is balanced against the target of that piece who says, well, look, that's really not fair. And you've said false things about me. So I don't, <laughs> I, I don't know how far I've moved the needle other than to say um, speech has never been completely free in Canada and it probably shouldn't be um, for the reasons I've just outlined, but I think the law of defamation, especially in British Columbia with our uh, Protection of Public Participation Act, strikes a reasonably good balance. There are a lot of defenses available to people to um, put sunlight on, on important issues of public interest, again, provided they're reasonably diligent and they're not, not actuated by malice. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Dan. So our next question here is something that maybe people in our that are watching can relate to. Um, here, my ex just posted a bunch of lies about me on Facebook. Um, can I sue them? And what other options might be available? Very common. So the first thing I would stress is that um, <clears throat> the common law uh, doesn't have a lot of regard for tellers of tales. It's the same thing our teachers told us at recess which is you shouldn't be spreading gossip and rumors. So uh, sort of a classic Facebook or blog scenario is someone repeats a pretty nasty rumor about someone, tries to distance themselves from it saying, well, it's just what I heard, right? There's a rumor on the street of, of whatever it is. And unfortunately, too many people think that they can insulate themselves from liability by putting a couple weasel words in the front and saying, well, that's just an opinion. Uh, you know, another line from the case law is, you know, that's someone who's willing to wound, but afraid to strike. And again, it doesn't get you very far. So I would say at first instance, if your ex is posting lies about you, whether they're the originator of those lies, or they're re, re, reposting what someone else has done, or, or um, use, you know, acting as a microphone for other rumors, lending currency to them, um, they're in the wrong. Absolutely. So what should you do about it? The first thing you should do is just address them directly about it. Like probably good advice in most situations in life. Uh, I wouldn't do so publicly. If, if a direct message is an option or a text message or a maybe not a phone call, depending on the relationship, an email, please stop it. Please take it down. If they don't respond, uh, what we call a demand letter from a lawyer is usually the next step take that down, retract, apologize, or else. And then uh, the third option, of course, would be, to, would be to sue them. If you know the identity of someone, it's relatively easy to do that, especially if they're in British Columbia. It gets more complicated with internet defamation when people use fake email accounts or anonymous Facebook posts. And, and we can maybe talk about that in a Q&A later when you don't know the identity of your defamer. If you have a pretty good idea, it's your ex, even though it's a fake account, no harm in writing perhaps a more gentle letter or email saying, you know, Mr. So-and-so, you know, I saw this on Facebook. If you're responsible or behind it, you know, please take it down. Um, the last thing I'll say is it's with all internet defamation, the easiest, quickest, and cheapest way is to get the author to take the comments down. Forcing... Um, often California-based tech companies, Facebook, Twitter, Google, to remove content is very difficult. And it's very expensive. They, in the United States, have very different defamation, freedom of expression laws. They don't have servers or a lot of assets in Canada. And in my experience, a judgment or an injunction order from a BC judge um, doesn't get you very far with um, American courts, unfortunately. Thank you, Dan. So Dan, we have a number of questions to go and I've noticed we have about 42 questions in the Q&A. So what we might do is work through the questions and then we'll turn to the live Q&A. Uh, our next question is a bit of a follow-up in a yeah. sense. Um, if you think you have a claim, what should you do next? You mentioned a few things like asking yeah. the person to take it down, sending a letter, yeah. filing a claim. A couple other things I, I should mention for sure. Uh, the first one is, is limitation periods. You've got two years. So be sure to diarize that claim. Uh, it, it's 
it's no good to sit on it for a couple of years and call a lawyer four years later and say, I've been defamed. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to have a new limitation date from every subsequent post or text message. So it can roll along, but um, you should act swiftly. You shouldn't sit on your rights with any sort of legal claim, especially when your reputation's at stake. Uh, you also need to preserve evidence. And I think most people know this by now, but save your text messages, get some screen grabs, print out the emails, put together a bit of a dossier. And if you're going to bring this material to a lawyer, it's going to save you money and it's going to make the lawyer's job a lot easier if you have a package that says, look, here, here's the posts, here's the text messages, here's the chronology, here you go, here's the evidence of my claim. Uh, if it's an internet-based defamation, you will need some evidence that someone in British Columbia, in the jurisdiction you're going to sue in, saw and read the claim, but you don't need a, a litany of subjective statements by your friends and family about how seeing the defamation or hearing it made them feel. As I said, damages are presumed, and then the judge just has to assess the gravity of it. But, but don't spend too much time getting um, really elegant, typed out kind of self-serving statements about how much it hurt you. Uh, it's, it's typically pretty obvious about, given the nature of the allegation, the type of harm that it's caused you. So keep an eye out for limitation periods. Keep an eye out for parties. There may be more people involved here. As I said, if you have a situation where your ex has started a rumor about you that you're a drug addict or you're a thief or, or worse and your ex's new husband or girlfriend is now repeating that claim now you've got two defendants maybe that claim has worked its way into a workplace whatsapp group and now three or four other people are repeating it you have to be careful about starting a lawsuit with too many defendants that can become unwieldy but but do keep a mind to who is publishing who is disseminating and if it isn't on Twitter or WhatsApp group, um, try and get a screen grab of how many followers, how many likes or, or retweets, so the court will have an idea of the, um, the spread of the harm. Super. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Yeah. The next question was, if you've tried writing um, letters and nothing has changed, at what point should you see a lawyer? I would see a lawyer if the defamation is ongoing. Uh, I think, generally speaking, if you've drawn your, your offense or that you take exception to postings, you've told the author or the repeater of the falsehoods to stop, that it's not true. If, if it stops, if it goes away, I think it's best to sometimes let a sleeping dog lie. I mean, again, if, if the defamation is grievous, if it's caused you to, for example, lose a job, that's, that's very different. But, but if it's more of a tempest in a teapot, something was circulating in a relatively small group or it's on a social media feed or a, a, a blog or a chat room and two days later it's already moved its way down i i would let it go you run you always run the risk in defamation of i forget all the facts of the oscar wilde case a notorious um, piece of defamation litigation that if you do go all the way and sue in defamation you are airing dirty laundry in court and at the end of the day, whether you're successful or not, or if all of the different allegations are proven or justified, a lot of intimate details and things that may or may not be flattering about you and your friends and your family and your workplace are all going to come out. So you really have to be sure that this is what you want to do. So I would say, again, in my experience, and everyone has to decide for themselves, even if you don't get a response from your letter, if the offensive conduct sort of peters out, I would let it go. If, if reaching out to the defamer inflames the situation, for example, they caption your text message and republish that, if it, if it ramps up, then you do need to see a lawyer probably sooner than later. Again, if you're seriously concerned about um, substantial harm to your family, your friends, your reputation. Um, but look, maybe you just need to take a couple, break, a couple weeks off of Facebook too. You know, again, I hate to analogize too much to the schoolyard, but if a group of friends or coworkers are just picking on you and being mean, sometimes you just have to kind of walk away um, rather than engage in what could be a very dragged out and expensive fight with lawyers. 
Yeah, I think that's that's practical, some practical wisdom. Um, so here's our next question is, what if you can't afford a lawyer? So if you can't afford a lawyer, um, I think you guys probably have a pretty good resource for some pro bono outlets. I know there's a law clinic up at, at UBC and, and there's other um, <clears throat> providers of those types of services. I'm not an expert in this area. Um, I think... What I would say is one of the problems with defamation claims is they often don't fit into a typical pro bono rubric. Uh, I think of a typical pro bono claim uh, relating to employment, housing, immigration, very brass tax human necessities. A reputation, unfortunately, doesn't often fall neatly into those boxes because, again, unless it's defamatory to the point where you've sustained some really material loss, you may not get a lot of traction. Uh, with certain of those outlets. Um, so I don't know, Paula, unfortunately, if, if the usual suspects of providers of pro bono legal services aren't available to you, um, I guess the, the last thing I would say is um, if there is a leader in your community, whether that's a sporting community, a religious community, an ethnic community, uh, academic workplace, sort of a neutral third party who may be able to take the defamer aside, or do a piece of writing on your behalf, uh, because so much defamation is personal, right? Um, that's worth a try. But if that still doesn't get you where you're going, where, where you need to go, I don't know what to tell you, unfortunately. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, those are some helpful suggestions. We've got some resources listed on the website as well. Thank you for that. So we've got a couple more questions before we turn to the live questions. The first is, what is a slap suit? I'm going to try and be more quick in my responses. So a slap suit is a strategic lawsuit against public participation. And that is an acronym. I think it came up in the States. And this is where, again, typically someone who is, is uh, wealthy, powerful, influential, a large corporation perhaps, or a prominent individual is on the receiving end of some criticism. Maybe an activist tells a fish farmer, that you're, you're polluting streams or, you're, or a tire factory that you're polluting a river or a politician that you know, you're a very bad man or woman. And they use their superior resources to bury someone in defamation suit, in a defamation suit, sicking their lawyers on them, tying them up in litigation, making all sorts of threats about the damages. And the result is, is we call it a chill, chilling speech. And before we had legislation in BC that, that prevented that, the risk was individuals with bona fide um, opinions, bona fide reporting on, on important matters of the day, and this includes newspapers, couldn't afford to litigate, couldn't afford to run the risk of defending their publication and being wrong because the cost of a trial was so high. So we have the, the protection of Public Participation Act in British Columbia. And what that does succinctly is, if you are um, a defendant in a defamation lawsuit, you can bring a slap suit. Again, we're in superior court. And what that does is it stops the defamation lawsuit in its tracks. Discoveries can't be completed. Trial dates can't be fixed. Documents can't be demanded from you. And what it does is, if you as a defendant can say, What's at issue in this lawsuit is a piece of expression, which is easy to do, and it relates to a matter of public interest, which again, important threshold, but a low threshold. The onus switches on the plaintiff to at an early stage prove that their claim has merit and that the defenses available to the defendant aren't gonna be successful. And on balance, the harm to them, based on the impugned statement, outweighs the public interest in the defendant, the author of, ex of expressing these ideas, comments, and facts. So what it does is it weeds out lawsuits that don't have a lot of merit, but are brought by angry people, by bullies, by wealthy people, by people with potentially improper motives to chill criticism. So it, it's a relatively new piece of legislation came into effect a couple of years ago but it's very useful and it's a great um, piece to defend freedom of expression. Beautiful, thank you so much, Dan. And here's our last prepared question, which is what happens if you are accused of defamation? What should you do next? 
And, and just uh, let you know, I'm going to unshare my screen as you answer the question and start looking at the Q&As coming in. Okay. If you've been accused of defamation, and yeah. you know, really, de again, depending on the context of whether you're a, a journalist for a blog or whether you're defaming people on WhatsApp, uh, if, if someone is drawing to your attention, they believe they've been defamed. If they're right and they tell you, look, I wasn't at that party, I didn't steal that car, I wasn't cheating on my husband, whatever the issue is, if you accept that, a retraction and apology is not only the right thing to do, uh, but legally it's an important thing to do because a prompt retraction and apology will either eliminate any damages you would face at trial. And, and frankly, uh, a prompt retraction and apology will make a trial unnecessary. Uh, but if you refuse to do so, when provided an opportunity, evidence of that can be used to justify aggravated or punitive damages at trial. So it's pretty standard practice if, if a potential plaintiff retains a lawyer, and this is certainly my practice, before I'm going to sue anyone in defamation, I always put them on notice, you have done things and said things that are false, that have hurt my client's reputation. I'm giving you this opportunity to say you're sorry, or, or correct, again, with professional journalists, um, oftentimes the piece as a whole might be okay, subject to a few dates and facts. So you can always clarify, you can always um, update an article or make some corrections. Uh, and I'll advise a client, yeah, retract and apologize if they're right. And if they're not, <clears throat> again, write back respectfully and say, well, I'm not going to because X, Y, and Z. And, and perhaps, and, and again, I'm thinking more in a journalism context, if a person is writing you accusing you of defamation, and that was a person who refused to speak with you about these issues previously, now may be the time to get clarification on these issues. Well, you know, if you didn't steal the truck, why did I see you driving around in it? Something like that. So, so deal, with, deal with the request for detraction apology promptly, Paula. Don't just ignore the email. Don't just crumple up the lawyer's letter. Engage with the process. It could be a get her to jail card if you fired something off hot under the collar one night when you shouldn't have. Uh, conversely, it's also a great opportunity to be articulate and eloquent in what you wrote and why. Super. Thanks so much, Dan. And there's um, a page dedicated to that as well on the People's Law School website. So that's another resource for anybody who has that question. Um, so turning to the live questions, uh, here's a question for you, the most popular upvoted question. Can one be sued for leaving a negative review of a company? Huh. Um, yes and no. How is that for a lawyer's answer? So um, reviews, age old, right? You know, I, I, I gather it used to be the thing if your restaurant was reviewed in the New York Times or the appropriate newspaper in your big city, that was a very big deal. And a good review would make a restaurant and a bad review could crush it. And that was always accepted typically as a matter of opinion. The defense of qualified privilege has never really applied neatly to um, broad publications like newspapers and the internet, but it's patently opinion. A food critic goes into a restaurant, orders a meal and writes about it. And they're inherently writing about their opinion and readers of a food review know that. And it's an established category of fair comment. So I say, again, subject to the qualification of setting out your factual basis and not leaving reviews by malice, it's defensible conduct. So if you go to a hotel or a restaurant or an Airbnb and you leave a negative review, set out the facts for it, right? And why we do that is important so that other readers know it's an opinion, can understand the facts which Again, those facts have to be true and say, oh, well, if those facts are all true, that opinion is, is a fair opinion. I may disagree with that opinion, but I could maybe see how someone could believe that. So set out the facts. Obviously, have used the service or make it very clear you're writing on behalf of someone else who used the service. And um, don't do it out of spite. And if you complete those categories, then I think you've got a good defense for uh, a fair comment. Because again, looking back at the, the basic elements, the proprietor of the establishment has said, well, you've said something that lowers my reputation. You've said I run a bad hotel. 
you've published it to third parties, the internet world at large, and you've identified my hotel. So they've proven defamation, pivots now to you as a defendant who's got a demand letter, and you would say, well, look at the elements of fair comment. And what I've done is I've stated something that's my opinion. This is Susie Q's review of this hotel. It is my opinion. I stayed here. The rates were too high. The bed creaked. The radiator wouldn't shut up and the food was bad. I gave it one star. I think it's a bad restaurant or hotel. I think that's perfectly fine. Doesn't mean you're not going to get a demand letter. Doesn't mean you may not get sued, but I think that's defensible. Thanks so much, Dan. And there's another question that's a little bit less um, upvoted, but um, can you be sued for a review on rate MDs? So that's the website for rating and reviewing medical professionals. I assume that the same analysis would apply here. It, it would, and people do get sued. And <clears throat> I should say that people can be successfully sued for a couple of reasons. One, they're actuated by malice. For example, in a rate MD scenario, they may have had a perfectly fine experience with this physician. They just don't like them. The, you know, the physician refused, refused to renew their opioid subscription. Perfectly professional conduct in the circumstances. And this individual wants to take this person down because they don't, they don't like them. They, they really wanted that Percocet or whatever the case may be. Or a person may leave a horrible review of a, of a physician rate MD without setting out any facts, right? So again, the fair comment defense has to rest in, there is a factual basis, and my opinion is based on these facts. So if you don't include any factual basis, it's just uh, disparaging comments about someone, the defense is, is not going to fly. So yes, you can always be sued for a review if it doesn't follow the five elements of, of fair comment defense, which I think are set out on the website and people should consider that. Super, thank you so much. Um, we've got about five minutes left, so we're gonna see how far we get. I uh, just wanted to say thank you to everybody for these incredible questions. Um, these are really great questions. I'm sorry I won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll do what we can. Um, this next question, Dan, is I have the provably false and defamatory written statements that were published in my possession. And do you consider bringing a defamation action by a self-represented litigant to have a reasonable chance of success? Any tips for self-represented litigants to find help with defamation cases? I would say that there should be no bar to a self-represented person ever succeeding in litigation in British Columbia. In my experience, our, our bench, our, our judges are, are, are patient. Uh, they're very considerate. They're respectful of self-represented people and they understand that retaining lawyers is very expensive and it's just not an option for a lot of people. And judges, again, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, didn't have a lot of experience with self-represented litigants, but they do now. So tips, be respectful, be organized. Your notice of civil claim, which is the foundational document that structures your claim, needs to be articulate, needs to be succinct, and needs to keep to the facts. What makes lawyers and judges sort of, their eyes can glaze over is when it's too much emotion, vitriol, hatred, frustration, clouding the facts. Who said what, when, and where? How was it published? Set that out. And in defamation, the words are the most important thing. So attach the defamatory posts as schedules to the back of, of the lawsuit, or um, caption the words you're complaining about verbatim, but this, the structure of the claim doesn't have to be complicated. My name is so-and-so. This person on the following dates published the following defamatory things about me. These are false. I've suffered damages. It, it, it can be done succinctly. You should be able to do that at the courthouse library with um, a look at some resources, certainly people's law school resources. I would type it up. Don't handwrite it. Just make sure you serve all the appropriate people and make sure that you always come prepared to court uh, with a full refreshed understanding of the facts and a clear understanding of what you want. Super, thank you so much, Dan. Um, so we're super close to time. Um, I'm going to ask this one last question and then we will wrap up the live questions. Um, so, if someone makes a slanderous spoken statement, 
with the knowledge that it's being permanently recorded by a second person to be published to a third, is that still slander or does the knowledge that it's being recorded make it libelous? A good question. I, I haven't considered this issue, but I would say if someone is speaking for the purpose of it being recorded, then they have libeled you. I don't, I don't think, because ultimately there is a permanent recording, a permanent record of what was said, and that recording is then being circulated. So if the speaker spoke with knowledge, one, that it was being recorded, and two, that it was going to be disseminated, then both the speaker and the individual who records it and further disseminates it are joint tortfeasors. They're both liable for the tort of defamation. One is the originator and one is the, rep the repeater. And I would, I would sue in defamation and I would say the law of libel applies, but so long as you're commencing your action in two years, you could plead it both ways, but I don't think anything really turns on it. And from an evidentiary point of view, if you have the permanent record, you don't have the same typical concerns of slander, which is, yeah, I kind of forget exactly what so-and-so said at the coffee shop because it was years ago. Um, so I would treat it as a libel lawsuit. Super. Dan, thank you again. It's been such a pleasure having you here and we look forward to seeing everybody again soon. Mm -hmm.